Hi, I'm Emma Carney. I am a, can we start this again? Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Carney, triathlon world champion, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Precision Hydration and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, expert editions, coaches' corners, interest editions, and featured performers. And hot off the back of our very popular expert edition last week featuring return guest of the show, Dr. Dan Plews, on all things high-intensity training for endurance athletes. Today, get set to enjoy a very special guest, on this featured performer episode featuring Emma Carney, multi-world triathlon champion, Sport Australia and World Triathlon Hall of Fame member. And this has been a much anticipated featured performer episode. When we floated that Emma Carney would appear on the show on social media, there was quite the flow of interest. Not only that, I've had many messages over recent times to feature Emma on the show. Emma recently released her autobiography, Hardwired, Life, Death and Triathlon. It's a book that I recommend for the bookshelf of every endurance sports enthusiast and particularly every triathlon lover. Growing up as a triathlete in the 90s, Emma Carney was certainly a name and a presence, gracing the covers of triathlon magazines, TV screens, wherever the triathlon enthusiast looked. By way of bio, Emma came from a junior running slash athletics background where she represented Australia twice at the World Cross Country Championships in 1994 and 1995, and then again in the Ekaden Relay in 1993 and 1994. You'll hear today how Emma turned to the sport of triathlon and in just 18 months took out the 1994 World ITU International Triathlon Union Championship in Auckland by a record margin at that stage of 2 minutes and 12 seconds. Following that very impressive international debut taking out a world title, Emma recorded seven ITU World Cup wins in 1996 and collectively across her career, 19 World Cup wins. From June 1995 to April 1997, Emma recorded an unbroken string of 12 straight ITU World Cup wins. Emma was the World Cup champion in 1995, 1996 and 1997 and of course the ITU now World Triathlon World Champion in 1994 and then again in 1997. Subsequently, Emma was inducted into the Australian Sporting Hall of Fame in 2016. And during today's featured performer episode, you'll hear Emma truly share around the highs, the lows and the learnings from what was a remarkable career and a remarkable chapter in Australian triathlon and world triathlon history. Emma shares on the early days, her rules of competition, training philosophies, and now as her attention turns to coaching up-and-coming triathlon talent, her ambitions to see Australia secure Olympic gold with her podium project and the burning reason behind that. You'll hear Emma touch on the controversial 2000 Olympic Triathlon Australia team selection snub, of which you'll also be able to read the full documented history in Hardwired, Life, Death and Triathlon, Emma's recently released autobiography. This really is an episode that epitomizes the highs, lows, and learnings. So I know you're going to really enjoy Emma's sharings today. This is my conversation with Emma Carney, multiple World Triathlon Champion, Sport Australia, and World Triathlon Hall of Fame member. Emma, 
Emma Carney, <laughs> I laugh because we had a little technical glitch on my end, but welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks for having me. Emma, this has been a little while in the uh, in the making and I, I know this is the weight is going to be uh, well justified, but uh, you've been busy. Uh, I've been busy reading your terrific publication, uh, Hardwired, Life, Death and Triathlon. And when I read the title, I had to smile because I thought, for what I know of Emma County, that sounds like a perfect title. <laughs> yeah, it was either going to be that or it was going to be no plan B. So um, Hardwired was the um the the final choice i've actually i'm writing another book now um following the the i suppose the path of the podium project which is uh my coaching in triathlon so it's um it's sort of an endless project like sport oh, i had no idea I, and i know you've commented on this emma that you really are such a gifted writer uh it's beautifully written <laughs> and i've heard you mention that uh, it's something you've always done. You always kept journals through your career. Yeah, I think it's important that um, it's a very sort of isolated life, racing and being an athlete, and there's a lot of experiences and, and lessons that you learn along the way. Yeah, I, I always read as a kid, and um, to be honest, I haven't read a book in a very long time. I think um, now I'm old, my concentration isn't as great. <laughs> But, yeah, I kept diaries and I kept documents and, and I've, a lot of people have commented on the detail of the book and conversations of the book. So it's, um, I'm glad I did. In that diary, I mean, this your golden era of, uh, of world dominance with, with triathlon, it, it was not as data-driven as it is now. So I imagine was it a lot of sort of subjective how you're feeling on the day, how you felt with the session or what sort of things went into Emma Carney's diaries? Yeah, it's a funny question like, you know, should we be more data-driven and should we be um, more, you know, the, the feel of, of what's going on out there? Um, I think you need to have a balance and I think sport will start to swing back to having that balance between data or the reliance on data that there is at the moment and um, the understanding of the sport. Like you, you shouldn't have to have a computer or a system to tell you how hard to go. You can use it as a guide. But at the end of the day, to be the best in the world, you have to actually perform outside what is considered to be normal and sensible. So you have to actually go beyond that. And I do think quite often these um, data-driven systems and training principles are limiting people's minds. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, I know growing up in the 90s as a junior competing, everything was on perception of effort. There wasn't any real GPS and... Uh, you just try and find that intensity that you could, you know, sustain for whatever the the distance of the race. That would have been the, the same for you, right, Emma? All of your your two world championships uh, victories in 1994 and 1997, you weren't looking at anything as you were racing, right? It was all just perception of effort? Yeah, to an extent. Um, I, I did have a lot of blood tests and things like that to make sure that my health was was on track. We did do testing. SRM cranks were around, okay. but I wasn't the kind of athlete that would accept whether something could be done or not. I'd much rather try and I'd much rather die trying, which I almost did as well. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, to, now I coach using data, but I use it in, um, in association with old school because I do think performance does come down to an ability to suffer and an and ability to, you know, have that misery cut balance. You, you do have to suffer. You do have to have misery in your life. And um, it's not all shits and giggles out there. It's um, quite often being an athlete completely sucks. So uh, you've got to get your head around that. Completely sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Inspiring really? the next generation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. Well, I, you know, that's that's what it is. It's um, it's a lot of suffering. And if you can out-suffer, you're generally going to be the best in the world. But having said that, I do know a lot of people think that that's how I coach, you know, suffer, 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 and it's it's nothing like that. It's, um, it's having a balance and it's having, you know, we get to this question of athlete well-being. Um, should we tell athletes that it's all great? Don't worry, you know, chuck in your real job. You're going to have a great life being an athlete, travel the world, drink coffees on an easy Friday. It, it, it's not like that. You need to hurt. 
you need to, you know, when you wake up in the morning and, um, you know, you've got a few hours training ahead of you and you, you're going to feel like, you know, <laughs> death warmed up already. But you, you, you've got to have that. You've got to be able to push yourself to that. Um, at certain points and you've got to have I think athlete well-being is around that positive environment to be able to do that rather than the environment of don't worry if you don't feel good don't train you've got to train whether you feel good or not got to train whether you feel good or not but obviously within that there can be that adjusting of the session oh yeah exactly yeah so you know Tuesdays might be a, um, a, a track session you wake up and you're stiff and sore so you can go and do your intervals on, on grass and, um, you know, off the track. So there, there is an extensive adjustment in there and there also needs to be that um, support around the athlete with regard to, you know, looking after their body, stretching, recovering, um, proper massage, proper treatment. But, you know, I've worked with some coaches and worked with some great runners and you've got to learn to get through it. A race is going to be tough. A race is going to hit you at times when, um, well, a great quote from Rob DeCostella, the great marathon runner, he once said to me, don't ever wait until you're 100% fit, Emma, otherwise you'll never race. Mm, that's so, powerful. Yeah, don't yeah. ever wait until you're 100% fit, otherwise you'll never race. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea that your misery cup was so full in life <laughs> until I <laughs> read the book and we're going to jump to that. But let's just go back. Uh, I mean, I think most people within the sport knew that Emma County developed a, a cardiac condition. We'll, we'll obviously discuss that, but I had no idea on the other chapters, uh, you know, uh, losing Jane, saving Claire as the chapters are titled in your book. Uh, I had uh, no idea on that side of things. But if we just loop right back to Emma County's very beginning, something that really jumped out within the pages of Hardwired to me was that you knew so young in life that really you wanted to represent Australia on the world scene in sport. And for you, that was always going to look like athletics. I'm curious, what what gave you, were you looking at anyone at that point? Was there an athlete you were aspiring to be like or who was Emma County admiring? I grew up looking at you know, Brad Bevan on the F1 triathlon scene. So who did Emma Carney grow up aspiring to be like? Well, I think this comes back to the data thing and, um, you know, how we create champions and how do we develop champions. And and it basically comes down to talent and commitment um, and the payoff. I never actually saw myself as particularly talented, but I was very, very committed. There must have been a level of talent in there and looking back, I think I was probably very highly self-critical and, and very, very um, diligent and dedicated into what I wanted to do. I wanted to be part of that great thing that was Australian sport and there wasn't a particular role model, but I always liked the athletes that could out-suffer and create these just legendary outcomes in sport. So anything to do with Australian sport, anything to do with... Uh, a comeback, anything to do with just being really, really at the forefront of Australian sporting results. And I wanted to be like that. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to, people to remember me. I didn't want to just be an also ran. I wanted to change the way that the game was was done. And yeah, it was it was running when I was a kid. And then triathlon popped up, and it became quite obvious that I was going to be good at triathlon. Probably, I think out of all the sports, if I'd taken up cycling, I was probably the most talented at cycling because that came so natural to me. And the way I coach cycling is very, very different because I have an understanding and it, it just seems a very, very simple sport to me. You, you train in a certain way and you're going to get outcomes and that's that's proving correct in, in my coaching. So it's, it's it could have been, it could have gone a number of ways, but I, I really liked, I liked the newness of triathlon. I, I liked the image. It was a lifestyle. When did you realise as a junior runner, I mean, you, you had Australian representative honours at the World Cross Country Championships, 94, 95, and then the Eckerton Relay, 93 and 94, um, running some sensational times, 907 for the 3,000 metres as an example in 1993. When did the penny drop that you weren't just committed, that you actually were talented as an athlete, as a runner? Was there a moment in time or some words spoken by someone you looked up to? 
No, I don't. I don't think there is ever a time where, as, as an athlete, that you sit there and go, "Yeah, I'm pretty talented." It's, <laughs> it's always it's always a chasing game. You always want to be better, and you know that led to problems in my career, and that that almost killed me with with my heart because you know I was always looking to fix it and change it, and something wrong with me. It, it can't be. I never actually thought it was actually a um, physical problem with you know one of my major, probably the, the most major organ. Once I, you know, once I made that sort of breakthrough and started running some top national times and making Australian teams, there was no time to sit back and think, oh, yeah, I'm pretty talented now. It's just like, you know, how can I lop off another 10 seconds? How can I keep going? How can I make this better? And that's the, that's the other side of the misery cup with an athlete because you're never happy. You can always do better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the story of uh, your father, David, uh, who you've described as very black and white and, uh, and analytical, uh, sitting down at the dinner table and uh, sharing with you that in, he believed you could be the world's, if not if you already were, if, if, you, if you picked up the swim, the world's best triathlete. Can you just share that? I think this is, uh, <laughs> you know, you had 18 months until you were off to the world championships, hopefully, and, and you were victorious in that. So reverse engineering, can you just share that story? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the full details of, of most of my stories are in the book. Um, you know, some things you can't write down on paper because you'd, um, you'd be sued for your life. <laughs> um, but, yeah, my dad is very black and white, and my dad was always a very big supporter of, of my sporting career and I think my dad was very misunderstood as well you know he ran Nike he was um, one of the head honchos in Adidas and he set up Feeler in Australia so very very big in the sports industry and dad was at every race and he was at every well not every but a lot of training sessions so dad was accused of being one of those ugly parents I think but dad actually shielded me from everything he shielded me from coaches when I was young he shielded me from overtraining when I was young, he shielded me from myself because he could see that if someone said to me, right, you need to run a marathon a day, I would have done that from the age of six. And that's not a constructive training program for a young kid. (laughs) But my dad's when, so I ran all through school and I was very much an individual sport. I I was very fortunate to go to a good school in Melbourne and I managed to get myself banned from team sports because I played to win, I didn't play to participate and I have never accepted the concept that you line up in a game of sport to just have fun. Like that blows my mind that people do that. And in PE at school, that is, that is the majority. So I, I managed to get myself banned from team sports the school said, look, you're doing a head in, you can run. And they gave me an exemption when there wasn't cross-country or athletics. And so I was running all the way through school, state national championships and stuff like that, and I managed to get into Australian teams. And there's a very, very big jump. So you can run a 9.07 for a 3K, which is what I got down to, but you need to be running an 8.30 to be an international class runner, even faster now. So... It's a frustrating time. You're not being beaten by athletes that are better than you. You're being beaten by athletes that are more experienced, able to race, can handle the volume and have, um, you know, the ability to put all those miles in their legs and race and race and race. So Dad could see my frustration and triathlon popped up on TV. And so we did did a local race and I sort of thought, well, how hard can that be? You know, everyone can swim, everyone can ride a bike. And it was horrendous. It was, you know, massive loss in the swim, got out, had no idea where I was because I'd been running around courses all my life, either around the track or on a cross-country course, and there was just people everywhere and I just spent the whole ride riding flat out and the run, every time I passed a girl, I'd ask her if she was winning and, um, you know, no, okay. So I'd chase down the next one. Are you winning? No. So I actually finally got to a girl and I said, are you winning? She said, yes. So that's, you know, I crossed the line and won. And I didn't think much of it. I just thought, wow, that's really messy, bit of fun, whatever. And uh, my dad had, in those days, you bought triathlon magazines and, you know, you looked at results. I don't know how he looked at the results because you couldn't Google it. But anyway, he looked at results and he, very black and white, and a trained accountant so if it works on the figures it's going to work and he's he worked out 
a couple of nights later at dinner, you know, if you learn to swim, I reckon you're the best triathlete in the world. And I've looked at the calendar and I reckon he said that Australia is very good, particularly the women. We're very good. So if you do well in Australia, you'll do well internationally. He said, make the Australian team, stay at home, don't go overseas, debut, win a world title. <laughs> so that was what we did. <laughs> and, uh, and was that the same year that you got that world title that Claire also picked up the under-23s? Is yeah, that the, yeah. In those days it was the juniors. juniors. So you had the juniors and the seniors. So, yeah, Claire, Claire bloody well won two hours before me, so or in the morning of. So I had to win, otherwise I went home the family loser. <laughs> there was no way I was going to lose that. <laughs> so the Carney girls uh, take the, the junior world title and the uh, senior elite world title with yourself, Emma. And, yeah. uh, and really from there, you, you kind of just went on a rampage. Uh, 19 World Cup wins, which is the equivalent of a World Triathlon Series you know, uh, event. You had from June 95 to April 97, uh, an unbroken string of 12 World Cup wins. Took out the World Cup Series title there, 95, 96, 97. Then obviously the two world titles in 97 and 94. And the other years, you basically were, were either injured or uh, ill. Yeah. And you mentioned magazines. I still have my old 1990s <laughs> triathlon collection. And uh, I, I just recall seeing Emma Carney on covers and Cadbury ads and uh, just thinking, wow, she's kind of unbeatable. Uh, <laughs> what would you say through those, I guess, golden years you know, it's a question you would have been asked before, I'm sure, but was there one race or one performance that really stood above the others? Maybe it was that 94 debut, nothing like debuting with a world title. Yeah, you'd, you'd probably have to say that changed the course of my profile and existence as an athlete. You'd have to say that because, you know, you leave Australia and you come back as a world champion with your sister and you've got Channel 2 videoing you or putting you on live TV through the um, <laughs> customs. <laughs> So that was it, was, it was a big change and it was a big, big jump and very, very odd way to start a career because, you know, I went overseas my first um, WTS or World Cup in those days was in Northern Ireland. I didn't even know how to put my bike together. So here I am, world champion, wow. thinking, oh, that looks about right. <laughs> so very inexperienced, didn't really have much idea about jet lag and things like that, but I'd done a four trips for athletics by then, Athletics Australia. So I, I tried to really do a crash and bash course myself, just sort of kept to myself and asked experts. You know, I, I always asked other athletes uh, that had been there before. So, yeah, it, was, it had to be 94. But the race that really, really was the hardest for me to win was the Noosa Tri. took me, I think it was my fourth go, came second and tough race for me to win. I, I watched on YouTube. I think it was '96. Was that your first? Was that one of your victorious years? '97 was the first time I won it. Sorry, '97. Yeah. I watched that race last night, and uh, I mean, just the crowds. There was just it was it was you know triathlon in the '90s in Australia was was household. It was so high profile. It, it yeah, it was, and it's um, I think it's that environment creates champions as well and that's mm. I think that's something that Triathlon Australia needs to um, start to work on is, is creating the environment. I don't believe that, that a nation loses talent. I believe that you have the environment to create talent, the ability to race and the thing that triathlon also with the age group is you, you do have to have a triathlon series. It's all very well to have the Formula One series on TV and just have the elites racing but you need to have the heart and soul of triathlon racing as well at these events and you need to have the age groupers because the age groupers create the atmosphere, they create the drive, the passion. They're the, the selfless triathletes. So you, we need to have a series again and we need to start nurturing that talent and not just having the elites on TV, you need to have a series that, that brings everyone back to the sport again. As you say, the uh, mass participation, the crowds, 
yeah. the F1 series, et cetera, are great for juniors like me who catch it and, you know, the flame starts burning. But as you say, it's that mass participation. Uh, yeah, well, it's no, it's, I mean, it's obvious that it works because the Noosa Tri is still the largest triathlon in the world for its size. So that format works. Yeah. And it draws people in. It doesn't die off. It has the passion. It has the respect. And, you know, my athletes, when they're ready to race Noosa Trial, they will do it every year because that's, that's the heart and soul of Australian triathlon. Emma, you mentioned the word heart. Your book starts <laughs> with a fairly a sort of, I guess, a, an assault of words, if you like, where you're outlining your uh, cardiac arrest in 2004 in Edmonton. You're on the <laughs> side of the road, out of the bus, uh, trying to, in, you know, I guess in, in still in... in in some of your management, et cetera, that this was serious. You'd been having challenges, feeling weak and dizzy, et cetera, and I believe for quite a few years leading into that. But can you share what happened in 2004 in Edmonton? Obviously the outcome is diagnosis of what had been underlying some of your, I guess, drop-off in expected performance. Yeah, so I, you, you mentioned that dominant period in triathlon where um, I had a, an edge over my competition and... You know, athletes, they do drop off towards the end of their career, but it's never a sudden, right, you go from that and bang, you stop winning. Mine was a, you stop winning. And, you know, looking back, it was really quite obvious that there was something something wrong. You don't just suddenly lose that. And it wasn't, I, I speak about it in my book, it wasn't the fact that the races were suddenly going quicker because there was that difference between the men and the women's finishing times was blowing out. So it wasn't as if they were going, anyone was going quicker. I was suddenly going slower and I couldn't work out why. And it took six years for me to work out. Um, and it was, it was a heart condition developing. So, and this is where it's really important with um, COVID. So I had a virus and I raced world championships in 96 and I thought I had a chest infection and I felt awful in the race and I scraped a miserable second and uh, was just disgusted with myself, came back to Australia and I was tested for um, what was, I was given a, a lung function test and it's quite relevant to COVID today. So I was then diagnosed, well, not with a chest infection, a chest virus. And they said, look, because it's a virus, you can have problems with, you may have done some damage to vital organs and particularly your heart. And this won't actually start to show until it starts to manifest. And they actually think that in 96, this virus created a little bit of scar tissue on my um, right ventricle wall and then it created, manifested and became worse and worse and worse until I suddenly had a cardiac arrest in 2004. And um, I, like I speak about this in my book, but mm. what's relevant today is COVID. You know, like a lot of people are dismissing it and I, it's, it's actually although it drove me absolutely insane being in Melbourne in lockdown and I can't even watch a news briefing anymore for COVID. <laughs> I just, just when I go to Coles and Woolies, I put a mask on and I just assume that's what the, the law is. It's, <laughs> it's very, very fortunate that we don't have it flying around our communities because for, for athletes, whether you're elite or age group, it'll, it'll screw up your career and it will screw up your body, and they don't even know what the damage it will, will be. And there's some elite athletes in world triathlon that have had COVID, and they're coming back. It's, it's kind of potluck whether you're going to be back to how you ever were. It's really dangerous. And, and you're certainly an advocate for uh, athletes being tested cardiac-wise, endurance athletes. Yeah, but even then you can't – nothing's going to – I can't say nothing's going to pick it up, but it, it's still not a foolproof test. So my, of course, my family was all tested. I've had a cardiac arrest, right? You know, two sisters, mum and dad, all tested. Yep, fine. About, well, it must have been eight years later, Claire was found, my younger sister Claire was found floating at the bottom of a pool. Well, you can't float at the bottom. She was starting to sink. <laughs> yeah. So she had a cardiac arrest and Claire's now got a defibrillator, but they can't find the same problem in her as me. And Claire's is a lot more aggressive. So I, I can go, well, I'm in cardiac arrest and 
you know, bang around for an hour, <laughs> rattle around and get help. Claire passes out, so she goes straight to fibrillation. So she has basically 20 seconds to get help. So Claire's is a lot more aggressive, but it's it might, might be the same, might be a genetic thing, maybe we're predisposed to it. Claire was always... Um, her body type, she was always sort of frailer. I always thought she was more talented than I was because she was a lot leaner. Um, and she had, we had some training sessions where she would rip my legs off and I'd think, whoa, this is going to get messy in a race. But um, she was always a little bit behind me with regards to strength. So, you know, who knows? Mm. Claire, she sort of had a few viruses and stuff, so... Yeah, you, you can never pinpoint it, but you just got to be careful and wary. Well, there's certainly that known scientific link of athletes that spend endurance athletes a lot of time in high heart rates. There is, uh, and I've forgotten the phrase, but, you know, that slight elevated risk. And, I mean, in the 90s there was prominent names such as yourself, obviously, Greg Welsh, Hamish Carter, uh, who did all sort of succumb to this uh, cardiomyopathy uh uh, illness if you like and it ended ends careers there's no way around it right yeah it, it does and I don't know whether it's so much you need to avoid ex, like high heart rates I think you need to modify things so there's appropriate rest mm. so I, I mean I don't know but mm. that's I, I don't think it's widespread enough yeah. To just purely blame one thing. Yeah. So it's it's a very, very complicated, undiagnosed, just area. something that, you know, if athletes are feeling off for no apparent reason, you really, really need to check. Yeah. Uh, in detail. Here, here. Emma, uh, I'm going to direct people to the book to read the very well <laughs> chronicled and put together uh, account of Sydney 2000. Uh, it, it, yourself... Uh, Jane Hunt, uh, Australian uh, historian there of triathlon, uh, and then your father's account. I mean, it outlines it in full. But uh, I was, I'm curious, I guess I have been for a while, what were you doing on that day in Sydney 2000? Did you just not want to know about it or were you watching the race? Um, I think, you know, for those listeners that don't know the story behind it, um, I was sensationally left out of the 2000 Olympic Games and it was it was the most, it was the biggest story in Olympic appeals given the fact that um, I was the most successful triathlete racing that distance leading in. And it was, I never spoke to the media, I never spoke about anything and I think, I don't think it's something that you can speak about publicly because whatever you say publicly, it's going to be like, oh, what a what a sour bitch, you know. It's it's never going to come across well. So I, it's really carefully written in the book, and it was I needed a historian to just recount the facts. So the reader is required to make their own conclusions, and so Jane Hunt has has reconstructed the Olympic appeal, and that is the only account of the Olympic appeal because um, the uh, the documents were somehow lost by Triathlon Australia, so you can work out how they were lost. Um, so that it's it was a, a period of my life where I just, I think the way that I dealt with it was just to just ignore it, just, just okay, I can't deal with that, I can't even process it, I can't even handle it, so I'll just ignore it. And I was first reserve and I was asked to commentate the Olympics and I was asked to do all sorts of things. And um, I actually, I went to Yamba. And, oh. uh, <laughs> I grew up in Grafton. So we might have been, uh, might have seen you on the road somewhere. Yeah, so, so I was in Yamba and, um, yeah, it was just, just, it wasn't just sad for me. I reckon it was sad for for the sport because we didn't, we should have won. We should have cleaned up. We should have absolutely lit up the, the, the world, lit up the games. And, um, you know, it was a team that was really, really disjointed that went. So I mean, it was, the, yeah. There, there was litigation. Um, obviously your appeal was on the male side as well. We featured one of your Australian compatriots, Miles Stewart, several months ago on a feature before episode and Miles said he, they only found out 
shortly before the, the final team. And I mean, that's a lot of sideways energy and distraction for all athletes. Um, my summary just in my ignorance at the time was, geez, that discretionary policy seems to have created a lot of problems. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of issues with selection and um, the men's team was finalised very early on. So okay. it was it was the women's team that was disputed right up until about 16 days before the games, and it was it was a it was a clause that was written and then interpreted in a different way to the way it had had been written and explained to the athletes. So it's. I mean, I think the best thing, you know, if people are interested in this, is to read my book. Yeah, certainly. And then, you know, then they can sort of draw their own conclusions. But it was, um, it was a horrible time, and it's, it's, it's something that I think left a little bit of a scar on the sport because it's never really been as dominant. And you know, this is this is where athlete well-being, this is where sports governance, and this is where the importance of running your sport in an open fashion so that athletes know when to race, what to do, get into teams, it's it's always going to lead to a better outcome than sort of the stuff that went on. You say, you write, and I've heard you comment, Emma, that you feel like you still owe Australia a triathlon gold and that's one of the driving forces with what you term your podium project with up-and-coming talent such as Emma Hogan. Uh, <laughs> that's, I was... Not surprised, but I was somewhat uh, in. Tr- no, I wouldn't say astounded, but it was like, "Wow, is that something that you still really feel indebted to? That there's a gold medal that you feel like you need to contribute to?" Yeah, and there's also I, I believe that um, triathlon Australian triathletes should still dominate the world in triathlon, and I don't see an. I don't see that the world has progressed so much in triathlon racing that Australia can't still be up there. So I think there needs to be a a more nurturing approach to triathlon. And, you know, they've they've started to make some changes and um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I truly believe I can make a difference in the coaching in triathlon. So rather than just sort of sit back I've uh, got amongst it. So, yeah, I've, I've got a – and you talk about the data. So if anyone wants any data that's any clearer than this, if your name's <laughs> Emma you come from Australia, you're, you're really likely in the sport of triathlon to be a world champion. So here we go. I'm coaching an Emma. Well, uh, <laughs> Emma, ja- uh, Emma Moffat, Emma, uh, Emma Snowsill, Snowsill, Emma Carney, uh, there is certainly the lineage. Uh, <laughs> Emma, uh, highs, lows, we've, we've covered it. I guess, some of both of, of those learnings. Uh, listeners of this show love the learnings. Uh, I heard you comment uh, on the Ironman talk show that there's three rules of competition for your competitive career. Number one, never underestimate your competition. Number two, be fitter than everyone else. And number three, know more than everyone else about everything. It sounds so simplistic, but were they literally maxims that you held on to your whole com- career? Yeah, I think it is that simple. And the other simple thing about training is, you know, all the data and all the systems and, oh, should I do intervals, should I do fartlek, should I do, you know, track, should I have my VO2 max max here and it's consistency. Mm. If you train train day in, day out consistently and don't break yourself down and you can turn up six months later and you can hand a little bit more or... You can race a little bit faster and it's not about volume in triathlon. It's about the quality of training. We've only got so much energy in our lives. So if you smash the hell out of yourself in a swim, you're not going to be able to have that energy to run fast. And if you can't run fast, you're not going to win. So it's, yeah, it's never underestimate your competition. That is, that is a cornerstone of life. <laughs> mm. uh, no more. So that when you're out there and you've got options, in your head, you've got options. Uh, be fitter. You know, there are a lot of people, a lot of coaches and a lot of athletes I see that, you know, save your legs on the bike and all that sort of stuff. If you fit on the bike, you're going to run fast anyway. And the person that's gone and smashed the bike and got away generally does run the fastest time anyway because they're running like hell. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's I – th- I think it is very simple. I don't think it's as complicated as everyone makes out. 
But I do think triathlon is triathlon and you need to know the sport to know what you're actually coaching for. Know the sport. That makes no. sense. <laughs> well, so, sport, for example, yeah. so, for example, you don't go to a swim coach or someone who's a swim coach and expect them to coach you for triathlon because swimming, you know, times number of reps, recoveries, is completely opposite to running. So running you need, it blew my mind when I went to a, my first swim session, my coach said do 20 50s. I was like, whoa, 20, whoa, how long are we going to be here for? <laughs> because, you know, like if I did 12 400s, that was a lot. And all of a sudden I was doing 20 and, you know, do 30 100s. I was like, what? So it's, it's very different. So you've got to know what you're training for in triathlon. It's not just swim, bike, run. You're listening to Emma Carney on this Featured Performer episode, episode 257, multiple World Triathlon Champion, Sport Australia and World Triathlon Hall of Fame member, sharing on her career highs, lows and many learnings. Support for today's show comes from Precision Hydration. Now, back on episode 234, we featured Andy Blow, sports scientist and Precision Hydration co-founder on an expert edition around all things hydration science. It was one of 2020's most downloaded expert editions and one that you'll definitely have to go back and download with a pen and paper for the many learnings. But one of the takeaways from Andy's sharings during that expert edition was that hydration is not a one-size-fits-all approach. And this is largely underpinned by the fact that everyone loses a different amount of salt in their sweat. I got a sweat test done by the Precision Hydration team here on the Gold Coast in 2020, and it's one of the most useful things I've done around pursuing my own physical best performance. Turns out I only lose about half the amount the average athlete loses in my sweat. And off the back of that, I've implemented my Precision Hydration hydration strategy. And I'm hoping it puts me in good stead for my upcoming Ironman debut in Cairns. But if you've ever struggled with hydration issues like cramp during long, hot sessions, then it's worth an imperative that you check out precisionhydration.com. Don't worry if you can't get to a personalized sweat test like I did. You can take their free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy to test in training. And as a listener of the Physical Performance Show, the Precision Hydration team have generously offered up 15% off your first order of electrolytes that match how you sweat by using the code PERFORMANCE, all capitals, 15. Just to recap, use the code PERFORMANCE15 at the precisionhydration.com checkout. And you can even book a free 20-minute video chat with any questions you have about your hydration strategy for your upcoming next event or race. So jump over, check out precisionhydration.com and use the code PERFORMANCE15 for 15% off your next electrolyte purchase. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio's Telehealth Consultations. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. If you are an endurance athlete struggling with bone, tendon or joint related concerns then scheduling an online 45 minute telehealth appointment with either myself or any of the pogo physio team can help get you back to your physical best jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth you're also welcome if you have an injury concern or question to drop me an email b.beer b-e-r at pogophysio.com.au for now let's jump back with this week's featured guest on this featured performer episode, Emma Carney, multiple world triathlon champion, Sport Australia and World Triathlon Hall of Fame member. What mistakes do you see athletes making, Emma? Maybe we'll break it down into recreational (laughs) and elite. So what would be Emma Carney's top three observed mistakes you see athletes making? I think this, you know, the closed mindset. I, um, if you suggest something new, people are like, whoa, no, 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 no. I've got to do my two-hour run on a Sunday and, you know. My theory around well, the reason behind that is the body is, is basically lazy, very, very adaptive and lazy. So if you keep doing the same thing every day, your body it will adapt so well it won't even respond to the stimulus. It'll be... Two hour run on a Sunday, body's like, yeah, okay. But if you mix it up or you run on different terrains or if you, um, 
negative split it or if you chuck a fart lick in the middle or mix things up. Um, the other thing is all this indoor training. I, I'm blown away. I'm blown away that someone would prefer to sit on a Zwift and sit inside than go and ride outside. Like lockdown is a punishment. <laughs> so why are you volunteering to lock yourself down and sit inside? Like I completely understand if you have to do that, you've got work, it's dangerous where you live or, I don't know, you live in a war zone, you can't get outside. But lockdown, wow, don't you enjoy the outdoors? Running on a treadmill is not the same as running on a road. You run on a treadmill, you're going to have poor leg lift, you're not going to activate your glutes, you're going to end up injured because you're doing the same pattern, bang, 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 bang. You run on trails and you're all over the place. You've got to step over this, jump that, go down here, up there, step sideways, run to a puddle. The, the IQ of um, or the skill of the discipline is not provided indoors. And the other thing about indoor racing, when you get on your bike, you don't race every single time. You don't have to race. You don't get on your bike and go flat out. I've, um, you know, there's, there's some junior kids down here and they say, you know, after school I like to smash myself for an hour on the bike. And I'm like, wow, that's the most damaging training I've ever heard. I'd much rather you go to a, a hilly course and ride up and down for 45 to 60 minutes. I don't want you to smash yourself. And you, you just, yeah. They, and the other thing is, you know, the stuff that the elite athletes are doing on socials probably isn't really what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> don't design your program around that. So, I mean, yeah. The, the, so I've written down there, keep an open mind, recognise the specificity of swim, bike and run. You mentioned yeah. uh, indoor training isn't necessarily contextualise then to uh, what happens outdoors. It makes me think of uh, Emma Ollie Williamson, one of uh, British triathlons physiotherapists who shared that when COVID kicked in in, in the UK, they had a lot of their uh, Olympic pathway athletes developing kneecap pain because a stationary bike doesn't flex and move yeah. around as much as when you're outdoors. So keep that yeah. specificity in mind. And then intensity control, uh, it, it seems so obvious, but not every session needs to be a smash fest. Yeah, and the other thing that I really um, I don't like, and I'll probably get hammered for this, I don't like running off the bike. I don't think you need to practice that. I think you need to be fit on the bike and you need to run well. So they're two different things. And, like, if you think, oh, my God, I don't think I'll know how to run off the bike, I would much rather you got a skipping rope and you skipped. So when you got off the bike, you did some skipping, you did you know, 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 45 seconds on, 15 seconds off, you will be absolutely cooked. But you're nice and light on your feet, light on your toes. Don't scar yourself about the run off the bike. Mm. Yeah, I, I heard you share that and it, it, I, I, I don't have a strong opinion either way. I, I find myself, Emma, as a, as a physiotherapist working with endurance athletes and just it's a bone bone health bone stress risk running on tired legs after yeah. a hard ride um sure there's that adaptability to get off and run with tired legs but i also understand what you're sharing and that is that there's something about motor pathways and just running to a certain uh you know feel and running after a long hard ride where you feel absolutely spent and you're not really going to put the intensity down yeah, it may not be as helpful as we all think. <laughs> mm. That can be left out there in, yeah, in the world I, of triathlon. Well, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, uh, look, I don't, I don't know of any scientific literature, so I think uh, everyone's welcome to their opinion. And uh, when you were going through your, your career, Emma, is that something you avoided, running off the bike? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I only yeah. ever ran off the bike if I was at a triathlon Australia training camp with some... Uh, Lunatic running a session. <laughs> <laughs> and so then uh, come race day, I guess some, it was somewhat exciting. You're getting to run off the bike fast. Yeah, I just, to me in my head, you know, it was like, right, I've got to run now. And it's not, you know, give yourself, give yourself time to find your pace. And I know in WTS racing, you know, everyone goes out and, you know, don't be gapped. But also don't go out like a scalded cat. I think mm. that is also another 
a bit of a sort of remnant of all this indoor training of smashing yourself every day, you've got to, you've got to race often to know how to race well. And I would, the opportunities for racing in Australia, I'd like to see come back. So athletes can do that and develop the racing skill. I don't, I mean, I've already said that I don't believe that a country suddenly stops having talent, but they, a country can stop having opportunities and if the only racing they do is, um, you know, a, I don't know, what are those super sprint days where they smash out a 1500 and then in the afternoon they'll let's smash out a crit and then the next morning let's smash out a 400 and then stick a run on the back of it. You know, that's not going to ever put together a really good understanding of the fact that, you know, it's an endurance sport and you need to understand pacing. Yeah, to to race well you need to race often i mean that you do and you do and you know some race skills you don't need to do a triathlon you can do a you can do a track race and you can learn how to react quickly so there's times and places to understand pacing and there's also times and places to understand racing so it's it's a very fine balance and it's you need to have a coach around you or an, an understanding of what you're working on for that particular session or race or training day or even calendar of events. Mm, that's, uh, that's powerful. And uh, I think perhaps one of the benefits of COVID may be a, hopefully a resurgence of uh, well-supported domestic racing. So, you know, let's, let's see. Uh, Emma, uh, you write about your personality <laughs> Self-described, lack of patience, attitude of bash and crash and getting stuck into things and begging for forgiveness later. But that was juxtaposed somewhat later in the book where you, you do lose your sister, Jane, in what is, uh, you know, a, a really harrowing situation. Uh, you wrote that Jane took on a treatment in the same way we were all brought up to face adversity in the Carney household. Don't buckle, don't give in and fight to the end. And then he went on and you wrote that Jane told you that you didn't cry enough. Uh, I couldn't imagine Emma Carney ever crying. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, when I first retired, I was coaching some corporates <laughs> and a grown man cried <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. But, uh, uh, yeah, Emma Carney cries. Emma um, probably, well, I've got a son now and I'm probably really, really run through the mill by my son. I'm hopeless with things like that. Family is very important to me. And uh, what Jane was getting at, so my sister Jane, she died of, of cancer very horrifically and very suddenly and very quickly. And I, I write about it in the book and a lot of people have said they can't really get through that chapter without crying. Mm. And I just, I just give it a factual account of, of what, took, what, what happened. And it was a horrible time just after I'd had my defibrillator fitted and you know, I was given a very, very quick, sharp, short lesson on how lucky I was that I was still here. But, yeah, Jane used to, she asked me to look after her and I had to be her slave. (laughs) So it was actually, there were times there where we did actually laugh a lot and she was a really, really, really good big sister to me growing up. We were very close, 16 months apart. I was always the boisterous one that was wrecking things. We had the same toys and, you know, mine were the broken ones. Jane's were the ones that were were always in good shape. And, um, yeah, Jane got annoyed with me that I didn't cry in front of her, but I thought crying was a sign of hopelessness and I never wanted to show in front of her that I'd given up hope because hope at that point when you're dying is all you've got really. And, uh, and then obviously she passes in, in the most tragic of circumstances, uh, circa six months, maybe not, maybe not even that, after the birth of her daughter, Zoe. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, for a family that seems so close together, yourself, Claire, your father, mum, uh, your world would have just stopped. Uh, you write like it did stop. Yeah, it did. And it, um, Yeah, my family emigrated from England, so we have no relatives over here, so we're always very close. And losing Jane, well, you never get over it. You never get over losing anyone. You just learn to live with it better. Mm. And, you know, I've got a a very old-school dad, and to see your dad buckle and to see your dad cry and to see that, you you know, he's never recovered. He's Mm. never got through that. 
And um, mum was actually the tough one. Wow. wow. <laughs> Carney yeah. women, eh? Uh, <laughs> I mean, as a parent, you are yourself. It's it's the unthinkable. You can't even really p- ponder it. It's, uh, it's 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 absolutely harrowing. One of the other key relationships, Emma, that jumped out, and I didn't have the insight prior to reading your book that you were so close to Les McDonald, the former ITU, now World mm-hmm. Triathlon president. And you know, I've heard people over the years talk about how form- how key Les was. He was the driving force in triathlons Olympic. Uh, debut in 2000 but for those uh, briefly for those that don't know just how cataclysmic Les was in that can you just touch on that uh, around what he fought for in terms of triathlon yeah Les was a visionary so Les was a um (laughs) he was his own worst enemy at times but he was someone who set about to do something if he thought it was right so he's he's the fact that triathlon looks after women and cares for women and has equal prize money equal you know time out there racing is comes from the fact or stems from the fact that les's grandma was a suffragette so she fought for women's rights way back at the start of of the fight and used to install into les as a male you need to champion this and so he was always telling me that if you ever see there's unequal you know inequality let me know and so Les was also someone who was going down this path of the Olympics and he needed, to get, he needed to get control of the sport. And you had Ironman around at the time and you had um, an international pro series basing itself out of America. And they didn't like the way Les was going. And we had the drafting rule. The Olympics movement said if your sport is going to be in the Olympics, the rules have to be enforceable. So you're going to have to remove the non-drafting rule because that wasn't entirely enforceable it was very it was often complained about I mean even today in Hawaii the the elites talk about missing the pack (laughs) we're not drafting guys so it's it's that sort of stuff that was going to confuse the general public so when Les removed that rule and drafting was was allowed he just got absolutely hammered and Mm. I came into the sport from nowhere, won the world title, and he suddenly had a new generation of athletes that he could see, um, you know, would would want to go to the Olympics. And so he grabbed hold of me and, um, he, you know, he asked me if I was going to, well, he asked my dad, and, uh, you know, is Emma going to want to go to the Olympics? Is, is she going to stick by the ITU? So I was one of the first athletes to actually stand by the ITU and just sort of battle that storm with Les. And Les knew that I copped a lot of flack for that. You know, the Americans didn't like me. Iron Man wasn't a big fan. I wasn't given a, you know, rookie of the year for the American triathlon magazine. They completely ignored me even though I won the world title. I didn't get a a shoe in until about 97 when I won Worlds again and it was like Emma delivers finally. So it was always, you know, (laughs) luckily I had a thick skin. What what didn't they like about you? Just that so you were supporting, <laughs> supporting yeah. drafting the, yeah, the it change because it, it, it was it was huge at the time. It was quite, yeah. It was it was huge, absolutely huge, and it split the sport. Mm. And Les just stood there and battered the storm. And every now and then things blew up. For pretty much my entire career, Ironman and ITU were suing each other. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I've got notes in the book where it finally stopped. So it was, it was a big time and, you know, Les would, Les would send me these faxes and they were pages and pages and pages, pages long, and I'd just sit there and read them. Just He said, you've got to keep up to date with what's going on in the sport. And it was just, you know, the ICU <laughs> and Iron Man just kicking the hell out of each other. Oh, gosh. But um, I think the sport's finally got there mm. and, um, you know, now we've got things like Super League popping up, which you're heavily involved in. Mm. And I just think, you know, the sport is going to evolve. We'll probably have e-racing soon. So my my um, criticism of in, indoor training <laughs> will get shot to bits. <laughs> but you know, it's it's going to be a sport that evolves and changes. And Les was one of those. Well, you can't say first because the guys that invented the sport and Ironman have done a massive job in the initial stages, and then you know, World Triathlon came in and. So it's a whole it's a whole group of characters, and I just got along with Les because he's was actually from the far north of England, 
and my crazy side of my family is from the far north of England and they all just sort of yell and scream at each other and that was a bit like Les. <laughs> <laughs> this is a crazy side of the, uh, the county uh, household. <laughs> that's, that's kind of somewhat not surprising. You're listening to Emma Carney on this featured performer episode, multi-world triathlon champion, Sport Australia and World Triathlon Hall of Fame member. Brought to you by the team at precisionhydration.com. If you missed last week's episode, it was an expert edition with New Zealand-based leading applied sports scientist and return guest of the show, Dr. Dan Plews. And during last week's episode, Dan shared around the hows, scientific whys, and practical what-to-dos when it comes to all things high-intensity interval training for endurance athletes. Here's a little snippet of my conversation with Dr. Dan Plews. So the interval session that I have done year in, year out, and when I worked in Singapore, I worked in Singapore back before I moved to New Zealand, and I was working with the cycling team, and the session that I always used to give them was eight by four minutes at around 103 to 105% of your critic, of your threshold power with two-minute recovery. And it's from a classic study that was done by um, Steptoe et al. And I think it was like, it might have been 1998, but it showed massive improvements in um, VO2 max. And um, I remember doing this on myself, uh, specifically, I did it week in, week out for almost a year. I never missed a session and my cycling improved massively. And I ended, I think I started doing them all at like 320 watts and I finished doing them at like 375 so um, yeah, increment uh, just just by and I kept it constant and I just increased the power all the way through and yeah, I used to dread the session though. I, I think I've actually mentally scarred myself from <laughs> from doing it ever again. But it's my my absolute favorite high intensity interval training. And the funny thing is on that, Brad, is that you know there's um, Stephen Steele who published some papers on you know great interval training sessions. And um, I think he showed that that eight by four minutes and four by eight minutes are two really good, um, really good sessions that you can do in terms of performance gains. And interestingly enough, they both had up to 32 minutes. So um, 32 minutes is a golden, the golden work load. To enjoy the full episode, high intensity interval training for endurance athletes featuring Dr. Dan, jump over to wherever it is that you enjoy your podcast from. We're also now over on YouTube. Just search The Physical Performance Show. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured performer, Emma Carney, multiple world triathlon champion, Sport Australia and World Triathlon Hall of Fame member, sharing on her many career highs, lows and learnings. Emma, uh, before we jump into the final two questions, the physical challenge for the week and also your single piece of advice to help listeners perform at their best, uh, there are some listener questions that have popped up on social. Joe Coombe uh, asks, I've already asked Emma this, so I know the answer, but it's worth asking, would Emma have gone to race Ironman if her career hadn't been cut short by the cardiomyopathy? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I um, I think it was one of the reasons why Trek signed me on was um, because, you know, Trek was very much Iron Man at the time and I just nagged and nagged and nagged Trek bikes until they sponsored me. And they said, well, will you go to Iron Man one day? And I was, yeah, I was, that was one of my things for sure. And I think I would have done well in Iron Man because that whole suffering and misery. (laughs) Misery, your misery cup would have been really (laughs) full. Uh, Jason Montia comments, I'm so looking forward to this. Emma was one of the biggest sporting inspirations. I was lucky enough to live near Eltham in Victoria and had the opportunity to see Emma go past me in training many times. (laughs) Plus trying to emulate the precision and calmness that Emma showed at races. Emma Carney definitely influenced the way I approached my sport. So not so much a question, but a comment from someone that was local to you uh, through those years. And mm. uh, and then Rob asks, psychologically, how did Emma come to terms with a stellar career being cut short uh, whilst watching her compatriots go on? I guess to some degree you've touched on that, but anything you'd add for Rob's yeah, sake? Yeah, that was, that was hard, tough. Um, you know, I've, I'm very, very fortunate I don't suffer from depression because I think if I did suffer from depression, I possibly wouldn't be here still. And, you know, I've been on heart medications where they put you on a depressant and my cardiologist has said to me, you know, how do you feel on these? And I'm like, wow, things are really, really hard. 
And he says, oh, it's a bit of a depressant. And I'm like, what? You should tell me things like that. So, you know, when I was first put on a like a beta blocker when I was first diagnosed and my career had ended and he'd put me on a depressant. <laughs> so things like that, it really opens your eye to depression. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I just I had no choice. I had, to get, I had to move on. I had to get on. I had to – I tried to ignore triathlon. I tried to pretend I didn't care over it. Who cares? They don't care about me. Um, but I do care. Mm. I really do. And I actually used to call Les a few times. And Les used to tell me to get involved in the sport. He said, you, you know too much. You, you're too useful. Stop being an idiot and come back. <laughs> you know, you're right. As it turns out, you can't take me out of triathlon, but you can take triathlon out of you. And uh, that was on page 291 of the book uh, <laughs> on a far lesser you know, example. But I remember crashing out at 19 in the junior nationals and I wanted to forget about the sport for maybe, it was actually 12 years. Uh, it was too wow. painful to consider, you know, what was going on. I, I purposely didn't look at it, didn't want to know about it. The internet wasn't quite as easily accessible and it wasn't until an age group, 30 to 34, I thought, no, I want to get back. Uh, yeah. and, and you can never really, I often laugh when, not laugh, I encourage parents when someone does lay down the tools that it's, always in them once it's been there at a young age it will always seemingly yeah. manifest and you'll express it at different in different ways throughout your life right yeah for sure and I remember I was really really ashamed and really really embarrassed that I didn't make it to Sydney and I you know I withdrew from a lot of really triathlon related people and one of them was Garth Proud and mm. Garth he you know he was a such a it's, that's another tragedy that we've lost Garth Proud. He was such a great guy to so many elite triathletes, such a supporter. And I remember I said to Garth after catching up with him for, you know, I hadn't seen him for a couple of years, and I said, I'm really, really sorry I never made Sydney. And Garth said, I don't care, Emma. I think you're a pretty good triathlete. <laughs> and it was like, wow, okay, cool. I just I hadn't even considered that was an option. Mm, wow. You hadn't considered that was an option because in your mind, that if was the everything. Olympics didn't happen, it was everything. I mean, it was yeah. the debut Olympics too. There was something yeah. special about Sydney. It was, it was huge. Yeah. Uh, actually, on the uh, YouTube binge last night with your performances, you do stop and I think give Garth a hug in the finish line of Noosa. Oh, yeah. Or maybe a, I think it was a haymaker or a hug. I couldn't quite see. <laughs> uh, Emma, final questions. Uh, physical challenge for the week. Every guest uh, issues one. What's Emma Ooh. Carney's physical challenge to the listeners going to be? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, ride your bikes on the road, <laughs> not, not indoors. Physical challenge. I don't know. Is it, a, is it about that? What kind of physical challenges do you have? We've had everything, Emma, from uh, non-physical, turn your phones off to uh, for a day through to Jen Lacaz's uh, 20 pull-up challenge. So Emma, Emma Carney... I, I'm interested, but it could just be riding outside. It could be that. Don't do that Zwift session or indoor training session. Go outside, even if it's raining. Yeah, but then I'd hate it if, you know, because the roads are dangerous and I can see that side of things. Mm. Physical challenge. Emma Hogan's walking past. What's the physical challenge, Emma? Training with you. <laughs> she said training with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, that might be it. Let's go with that. The physical challenge is training with Emma Carney. Uh, you do have restrictions on your heart rate though, right? So uh, that might be yeah, and I'm us. Yeah, and I'm sitting here in a boot because I've tried to keep up with Emma, so... <laughs> <laughs> She's taking the fun out of my training. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, uh, final question. Every guest of the of this show uh, distills their learnings from their career into one piece of advice. Now, I know this is incredibly difficult, but if Emma Carney had to distill everything you've learned across your career, the highs, the lows, and all those learnings into one piece of advice to help listeners perform at their best, what is that one piece of advice going to be? Be confident in your own ability. Be confident if, in your own ability. Yeah, because if, if you truly want to do something, you will achieve it. Confident in your own ability. If you truly want to do something, you will achieve it. And can confidence, Emma, be taught, nurtured, or is it just innate? I think it's a skill. So I think it can be taught. So, for example, a younger athlete is going to go into races and go, ooh, ooh don't know, don't know, don't know. But, you know, five years into their career, 
after having raced and been exposed to the pressures, been exposed to the tactics, been exposed to other athletes, you know, screwing them over in races or whatever, that confidence will build. So confidence needs a, a, that environment of, of nurture as well, not, not that. I mean, you, I don't think you can train well in a negative environment. So you have to have that good environment, that nurturing environment and that care around you as an athlete. I think that's, you know, going back to the athlete wellbeing thing. So mm. I do believe you can develop confidence, yes, for sure. Yeah, okay. So it needs to be nurtured and the environment matters. And you mentioned that when two, in 2016 when the Australian Sporting Hall of Fame inducted you, you gained, in your book you write, you gained some self-confidence back, which for me was interesting because I didn't think Emma County would lose self-confidence Oh, yeah. God, if you get hammered enough, it's, um, it's a Ned Kelly effect, you know, so you can get a good person, person that does well in society, and if you hammer them and treat them like dirt or don't even give them any respect and just leave them out there to, to survive, um, that person can just become broken. So, I, yeah, I was broken, just hated it, broken, didn't want to be a part of it, but now I... You know, for the rest of my life, I will be forever involved in triathlon. Absolutely. Mm. And what a great way to draw this uh, to a close. Emma, your contribution has been uh, large to the sport, the endurance sporting community, and as we've just heard, it's not over. Uh, if the listeners want to find out more, uh, where can they go? Obviously, there's hard wide, life, death, and triathlon, which I think needs to be on every triathlete or endurance athlete mm-hmm. shelf. It's a great read. Uh, I've I've bought a copy for a, a friend of mine, and more to come. Uh, where can they find? Where can listeners pick up a copy, Emma? They're available online anywhere. I think the cheapest is at my publishers, Ryan Publishing. Um, but you can you, you're there on Amazon, Booktopia, everywhere. So you just Google. Emma Carney, awesome book. <laughs> <laughs> no, hardwired. And Hard. I think, yeah, so, they, yeah, they're available. They're, they're not in stores yet. I'm um, having discussions with my publisher and the publishing world is very complex. So, so yeah. So hang, hang 10, they may be in stores. <laughs> yeah. If not, we're all used to ordering online now. Uh, yeah. And then obviously over on social, uh, you've got a great social media presence at Emma Carney. Yeah, Emma E. Carney. There you go. Thank you for the uh, correction. <laughs> <laughs> I think Emma Carney, just in the search, would still bring you up pretty easy, but at Emma E. Carney. Uh, Emma, thank you once again, and uh, we certainly wish you all the best uh, from here on in. Thanks for having me, and I hope to see many people at the races. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode featuring Emma Carney, then be sure to reach out and let Emma know. You'll find Emma over on Instagram at Emma E. Carney, C-A-R-N-E-Y. And do yourself a favor and pick up a copy of Hardwired Life, Death and Triathlon, Emma's recently released autobiography. As I mentioned at the top of the show, it is a must for every endurance sports enthusiast. That's Hardwired, Life, Death and Triathlon. Just Google it and get a copy in your hands. You can also jump over to emmacarney.com and there you'll find out more information about Emma Carney's coaching services as well. A massive thank you once again to today's show sponsor, Precision Hydration. If you're serious about performing at your physical best, then take advantage of Precision Hydration's 20-minute free video call to explore your hydration strategy for your upcoming next event. Jump over to precisionhydration.com and be sure to also take the online sweat test. It's free and figure out just how much salt is in your sweat. That will determine the hydration strategy that you need to put in place. Going on from that, when ordering your electrolytes, you can use the code PERFORMANCE, all capitals, 1515 to get 15% off your order. Now, also a massive thanks to those that have been supporting the show through our recently launched The Physical Performance Show's Learnings Membership, which is really simple. If you'd like to contribute to the production of the show from just $5 per month, then we've made that possible over on Patreon. Just search The Physical Performance Show over at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, 
patreon.com. And in return for our show's patrons, we'll grant you free access to all upcoming live stream events and also all back catalogued live stream events as well, including the very popular 2020 live streams with Dr. Stephen Seiler and Dr. Shona Halson. And a huge thanks to our new patron for the show, Christine Wallace. Christine is an avid runner and endurance athlete herself, also a physiotherapist hailing from far north Queensland. So thank you, Christine, for your support of the show through Patreon. Massive thanks, as always, to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, and Matthew Walding on all things show graphic design. Thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews over on iTunes, and also for those tagging the show in at Physical Performance Show over on social with your podsies. It's always a whole lot of fun to see those coming through. Now, get set for a whole lot of learnings coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show featuring Rini McGregor, UK-based sports dietitian. I caught up recently with Rini to explore all things fueling for health and performance. It's an expert edition you are not going to want to miss. There are oodles of learnings to take away from Rini's sharings, so be sure to be tuning in next week to the Physical Performance Show. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.